Oh, I didn't. Okay, I'm gonna to call to order a meeting of the City of Santa Rosa Cultural Heritage Board and ask for roll call, please. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. Okay, we have no minutes, so we're gonna move right on to item 3.1, which is the appointment of a vice chair. We have a vacancy in the vice chair uh, role on the CHB. Vice chair's primary responsibility is to uh, obviously chair the uh, public hearings and uh, represent the board in the absence of the chair. And I will open it up for uh, any board member to nominate uh, him or herself or any other board member uh, for appointment of the vice chair. But before I do that, I wanna ask a point of clarification on the um, number of votes that are um, required to carry this. Um, under any circumstances, tonight we have six um, board members present, so I think the answer would be four tonight. But I think it would be four under all circumstances. Is that correct? And that, that might be correct of all CHB actions. I believe that is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, with that, uh, does any board member want the floor to make a nomination? Board member Groninger. Yes, I would nominate uh, board member Mark DeBacher as uh, vice chair. Do I have any other uh, nominations or uh, board members wishing to have the floor? Board member DeBacher. Thank you. I'd like to uh, nominate uh, member Brian Moisa. And do I have any other motions or uh, board members wishing to make a nomination? Uh, 
so I think that we have multiple nominations. It would be um, appropriate to have a, a discussion if, or comments. Uh, so if anybody would like the floor, uh, share your thoughts and lobby uh, for or against any uh, person, please feel free. Board Member DeBacher. Well, thank you. I do appreciate the nomination. Um, I would like to say that uh, I don't know whether it's officially part of its uh, duties or not, uh, but often the, the vice chair is uh, viewed as the likely successor to take the chair. And uh, I would have to decline that uh, as um, my responsibilities on uh, board members of uh, at least three other nonprofits uh, would uh, not allow me to have the time to, to do that. So um, I would like to decline the vice chair. Uh, board member Groniga. <laughs> I accept your declination, I guess, uh, and I would then wholeheartedly ratify Brian as the nominee. How do you feel about that? As this is, um, I think, my second meeting with the Cultural Heritage Board, I'm really feeling that I would like to have a little more experience, a little more time with the board um, to take on, you know, such an important role um, to move things forward. I would accept the role if that's what we need to do tonight. But if we had another nominee that's, you know, been here a little longer and a little more experience, I would probably be more comfortable with that. Do you mind uh, just turning your mic on? Would it be possible to nominate then Laura Fennell? I would be open to that, um, you know, if the, if the board is in, in support. Um, I've been on for a couple years now and I'm getting the hang of it. So. Okay, are uh, there any further comments before I ask for a motion? Um, so with, with that, if I could then decline the nomination with all appreciation of receiving it, um, I'd like to decline the nomination. Okay, so we have one nomination from the floor and do we need a motion to uh, appoint board member Fennell as uh, vice chair or is the nomination from the floor enough for me to ask for votes. Yes, um, we, it's not an official um, voting machine type of motion, but we can take a roll call vote um, so that's clear that everybody has participated in, in voting and supporting the vice chair nomination. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, the nomination is for board member Fennell to be vice chair of the Cultural Heritage Board. It was a uh, nomination from the floor and uh, board member McHugh, uh, your vote please. I vote aye. Board member Fennell, your vote please. Board Member DeBacher, your vote, please. Aye. Board Member Muser, your vote, please. Aye. And Board Member Ronega, your vote, please. Aye. And I also vote aye, and Board Member Fennell, Vice Chair Fennell, uh, congratulations. Okay. Next, we will read our statement of purpose. The Cultural Heritage Board shall consider the following matters, standards, guidelines, and criteria to the extent applicable in determining whether to grant or deny a permit, whether the proposed change is consistent or incompatible with the architectural period of the building, whether the proposed change is compatible with any adjacent or nearby landmark structures or preservation district structures, whether the colors, textures, materials, fenestration, decorative features and details proposed are consistent with the period and or are compatible with adjacent structures, 
whether the proposed change destroys or adversely affects an important architectural feature or features, and the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation and guidelines for rehabilitating historic buildings, as well as such other matters, criteria, and standards as may be adopted by resolution of the Cultural Heritage Board. And we're going to move on to public comment. This is a time for any member of the public who is here and wishing to speak on a matter of interest to the board that is not uh, on, the, on the agenda elsewhere uh, to approach the podiums and uh, have three minutes to speak. And uh, I am going to open the public hearing and public comment, excuse me, and I'm not seeing anybody approach, so I will close public comment. And we're gonna move to statements of abstention. I can't imagine anybody has one, but uh, does any board member need to abstain from any of the items tonight? Yes, I need to abstain from item 6.1. Any other abstentions? No? Okay, so we will give board member Muser time to exit the chamber. Chair, would uh, you like notifications uh, uh, of who's visited the site at this time or once we actually get into the, the item? Uh, once I open the item, please. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we're gonna move from item five, statements of abstention, to item 6.1. It's a public hearing on a landmark alteration permit for the Muser remodel at 403 Brown Street. This is an ex parte disclosure. Um, Board Member DeBacher, anything to disclose? Uh, yes, Chair. I did visit the site and I also did meet privately with the applicant. Board Member Ronica? I visited the site and really have no further questions. Vice Chair Fennell? I have visited the site um, on numerous occasions. It's in my neighborhood, but not within distance. And Board Member McHugh? I have not visited the site. And I have visited the site and I have no further non-public information to disclose. And with that, we would love the staff presentation, please, and Ms. Murray. Good afternoon, Chair Edmondson and members of the board. The project before you is a proposed remodel at 403 Brown Street, a restoration project. Okay. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, the, the project, the overall project includes the removal of the second story addition an add-on to the uh, primary dwelling unit, construction of a new garage and studio structure, it's one combined structure, fence replacement, and um, they're also extending the, the fence line, and a removal of a holly tree. The site is located on the corner of Wheeler Street and Brown Street. Uh, it's within a planned development community. It's within the Burbank Gardens Preservation District. And the, the zoning is consistent with the general plan land use designation of low density residential. Here's an, uh, an aerial view of the site. And this is, uh, I think it's changed a little bit because there's been some de demolition work done, which the applicant did receive a demolition permit for. Uh, here's a, a site plan, and when we get into the design of this project, I'm going to defer to the applicant because uh, we, we have a lot of um, redundant comments, so <laughs> you only have to hear it once. So um, here's a site plan, and it shows where the replacement garage will be on the um, on the right-hand side of that, that graphic. Um, again, it's removing the, uh, the proposed removal is the second story. The... Um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to orient myself. I don't have a north, uh, the, cor the back corner of the house uh, in the middle of the yard is where the addition is being added. The fence line will continue around the house and it is um, set back 14 feet on uh, the, the uh, Wheeler Street facing elevation, um, which is consistent with um, the regulations. 
Here's an old photo, date unknown, um, but it shows the home before the second uh, story was constructed. Um, and then in the lower left-hand corner there, that's what the, the house looks like. Well, when the, both the, cu the current photos on the left-hand side are current and they show the second story. So this is a proposed elevation from the Brown Street. And there you can see the fence on the left hand, um, uh, on the left side of the house, and that's where um, new fencing is proposed. And then for, on the Wheeler side, there's the, the new garage slash studio structure, and the fence will be aligned between the two structures. Uh, the following documents, these documents were um, reviewed during um, staff's analysis of the project. Uh, it's important to note, you know, the, um, there was a, a Cultural Heritage Board reg resolution adopted, number 209, that um, provides a lot of the design criteria, and I think probably that's, that it's, it's a significant tool in the review process. So the observations that the proposed remodel will restore the appearance of the dwelling units to its original appearance or the street facing elevations. The area where the addition to the dwelling unit is proposed is not readily visible from the street, so it won't change that. Um, the, the proposed garage studio structure is generally the same location as the previous structures were. There was not just a garage, there was also a, a detached studio that was uh, taken off the property previously. Um, and then the location of the fence will not obscure any of the uh, street facing elevations. Project has been found in compliance with CEQA under several different um, categorical exemptions. Um, and the, it, it's, it's infill development and it, it adds minor structure, uh, structures and does minor alterations to existing structures. I, this, uh, pres this preservation or this presentation was created before I did receive several comments, I think three, um, all in favor of the project. Um, I believe that those were forwarded to you in the um, PG&E PSPS event. It kind of got blurred, so. So with that, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Cultural Heritage Board approve a landmark alteration for the restoration of the property located at 403 Brown Street. And I know the applicant has a pres uh, presentation, I seem to be crossing those words up today, um, and um, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Board members, any questions for staff before we hear the applicant presentation? Okay, uh, great, we would love to invite the applicant to give her presentation. It's always good to see a familiar face. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Cultural Heritage Board, Lisa Cran, the applicant at 403 Brown Street. As Susie indicated, we do have some repetitive notes. I'll try to gloss over those things and give you the detail where it uh, may be more appropriate. But this slide indicates the main components of the proposal, as indicated removal of that second story addition, construction of a new garage and studio, the addition of about 180 square feet of living space on the southwest side of the house, uh, repair and renovation of the exterior of the house along with the roof, the addition of fencing on uh, both street sides, Brown and Wheeler, and removal of that holly tree. 
And the house at 403 Brown Street is a California bungalow. The most prominent features, as you can see in this photograph, are the prominent front porch with rock piers as well as the fireplace. And the house is clad with wooden shingles. A couple of additional early photographs of the house. Oops. Getting ahead of there a little bit. Um, that show the home uh, as the other photograph did uh, prior to that second story addition. With a little more detail on that, uh, the second story is shown in this photograph here. We believe it was built sometime in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And you can see from the photograph that the exterior siding and the windows do not match the original house. The addition was also built without sufficient bearing uh, walls for support of the structure. We've experiencing some sagging uh, on the first floor. And also the interior access is very awkward to that second story. Second main component is the construction of a new garage and studio to replace the former garage and utility building, which are pictured here. And as indicated, the city of Santa Rosa issued a permit for demolition of those structures this past summer, since the structures don't contribute to the historic character of the site as documented in our historic report. Another component of the proposal is uh, general repairs to the house. That would include replacing roofing materials, repairing the foundation and structure as needed, replacing the wooden shingles with like where they are necessary, where it is necessary, uh, to restore the original windows and doors and uh, do other repairs as needed. And the proposed site plan indicates the location generally, oh, I guess I can't get my cursor on there. But at the southwest corner of the house, you can see the expansion area, about 180 square feet of living space, the replacement garage and studio, now set back five feet from the rear property line, where it's uh, the prior buildings uh, encroached a bit on that setback. And then the holly tree is kind of at the, the top left, of the site plan uh, and, and faces Brown Street, it's right in the front yard. So the proposed renovations, this would be the Brown Street side. That would include restoration of original light fixtures that are on either side of the door. And as Ms. Murray indicated, uh, the addition of relocated fencing on the, on the front. And the south elevation, this is uh, in the interior of the lot, but it would remove a uh, circa 1970s addition to the southwest part of the house, replace that with about 180 square feet, extend the south gable to create a new porch and add some French doors there. Again, not visible from the street. Uh-oh. This is the Wheeler Street. Oh, no, it's not. What is that? Hmm. It's very odd. Well, I don't know why that's not showing, but on Wheeler Street, uh, the street elevation, uh, we would also be restoring original light fixtures, uh, adding new relocated fence fencing, and um, evaluate and restore the fireplace as well. So apologies for that slide. So the new garage and studio, uh, this slide illustrates the east and west elevations. Those are also uh, interior to the lot, but the plan is to build a new porch that would complement the other porches uh, in the, on the structure and to reuse the original windows uh, that have been removed from the house and also from the uh, second story in this building. In terms of architectural material, uh, the general approach would be to match the existing architectural style of the building. As indicated, uh, restore and reuse existing windows and other building materials as we can. And this is just a detail of uh, the proposed fencing on both facades. It would uh, be a six foot fence made of uh, premium grade redwood. And lastly, the holly. As indicated, this is on the um, Brown Street side and is indicated there on the plan. 
And lastly, I just want to leave you with uh, examples of two prior renovations that my husband and I have completed in the Cherry Street Preservation District as an indication of our work and, and hopefully uh, uh, indication of good faith in the future work that we plan to do at 403 Brown Street. So with that, that completes my presentation. I also would like to acknowledge that uh, Lily Bianco, who prepared our historic report, is in the audience this afternoon, as well as John Stong, our project architect. So if you have any particular questions for them, they are also available. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krantz. Board members, any questions for the applicant or staff? No questions, okay. Uh, all right, well, let's find my agenda here. I usually have a little bit of a break there as somebody asks a question. I suppose I'll just uh, ask if any member of the board wants to move a resolution uh, for the purposes of discussion. Oh, board member, uh, or board member, wow, <laughs> Ms. Hartman. Thanks for the elevation to board member, but no, I'm just a uh, um, public hearing. We'd like to open the oh, public hearing. Oh, my goodness, okay. This is why I need the agenda in front of me, even though I've been on this dais a while. This is a public hearing. Uh, I don't have any cards on this item, but you don't need to have filled out a card to speak. Uh, if you wish to make comments on this project, uh, please approach the podiums at the top of the room and state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. And I'm going to open the public hearing, and I'm not seeing anyone approach, so I will close the public hearing with thanks to Ms. Hartman and bring it back for discussion. Uh, would any board member like to move a resolution on the, make a motion on the resolution for purposes of discussion? I'll move the resolution. Resolution of the Cultural Heritage Board of the City of Santa Rosa approving a landmark alteration permit to remodel, restore, and replace structures for the property located at 403 Brown Street in the Burbank Gardens Preservation District, assessor's parcel number 0092624, is that zero? I think 001, file number LMA19-007, and wait for the reading of the text. Does anyone second? I second. Okay, the motion was made by Board Member McHugh and seconded by Vice Chair Fennell. And uh, Board Member DeBacher, would you like to make any comments? Start us off. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, we're delighted to see this project. This is uh, uh, one of the best, most refreshing projects I've seen in a while. Uh, it's also nice to see a project that's a restoration uh, it's been quite a while since we've had a uh, straight restoration project come before the board. Uh, there is an addition on this one, of course, uh, uh, and new construction as well, but it's, um, it's very heartening. Uh, it's also very heartening to see the previous work by the applicant on restoring historic properties in the area. So uh, it gives a high level of, of confidence moving forward. Um, there, there were a few things I would have liked to have seen uh, beyond what we received uh, on this project uh, as it's coming for the actual landmark alteration permit, uh, specifically a roof plan, particularly since they're removing the second floor and need to put the roof plan back. Um, uh, I would have liked to have seen some of that. Uh, also, uh, though they're planning on restoring the windows, which I highly, highly commend, um, uh, Anyways, if there was any thought of putting new replacement windows in, we'd like to have seen that. Um, though those were really the only things that I had that uh, I thought that would have liked to have seen uh, in addition to the presentation. Um, if there were, um, so the, with that in place. Um, I think that the architecture of the additions is properly scaled, proper roof slopes, proper massing uh, on it. Uh, I do have a slight concern that the new construction will match in every way the existing construction. 
And I think following our guidelines, we would like some modest element to differentiate new from existing work. Um, the existing building is so unique and so powerful in its statement, that's, that's a very difficult thing to do on this one. Uh, any deviation from the existing master is, um, uh, will, will be perhaps overly obvious. Uh, and that's one of the things I'd like the board to kind of have some discussion on. Our standards are that it should be differentiated in some way, and I'm having a difficulty in calling for that on this project. Um, other comments about it. Uh, I appreciate the fact that this was hand-drawn rather than CAD. It takes a hand-drawn set of drawings to convey the stonework and other aspects of this project that would be very, very difficult to convey in CAD. And the artistry of the drawings uh, is very helpful in this case. So I commend the, the architect that put behind it, the designer. Um, one of the things I wanted to make the board uh, aware of is that uh, it's not easily seen, but on the porch columns, on the top of the base is um, an original lit address sign uh, that fits into the uh, trim that goes around the top of the stone. Um, that was a unique and character defining feature of the houses of this type. And um, I would very much like to see if it's not in the budget to get that working again, to at least ensure that it is kept in place for a potential future restoration. It would be on the extreme northeast column corner, and you'll see a, a recess in the uh, thing where a, a lit address sign would have been at one time. And uh, I think that that is uh, very consistent with that period of architecture, and uh, I would like to ensure that that doesn't go away. Um, Another thing uh, I would just like to add would be that um, should the applicant undertake the, the, the difficult and expensive work of restoring the windows, which again I highly commend, and find that they're not able to reuse the existing windows on uh, the new work, which is what I understand is what they're planning to do. They're planning to take some of the windows off of the second story edition and we use those on the uh, garage and residential unit that's being added. Um, or if they find difficulties in the restoring the main windows, that that would uh, constitute uh, an item that would need to come back to the board for replacement windows, as it would if this was an independent project. So, in other words, I don't want to give carte blanche to a replacement window should they get into the project and find the need to, to do a replacement. I think that that wraps up my comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, board member Groninga, any comments? Just a few. Uh, I concur that this is from my perspective, and going back a number of years, is probably the most comprehensive and uh, uh, thorough proposals on a, uh, a uh, remodel to a uh, contributing home. Also, uh, I have to say my expectations, because of the uh, uh, background of the applicant, were probably exceptionally high. And those expectations were met in every way. Um, I'm also very confident that the applicant uh, has and will uh, pay uh, attention to detail, uh, certainly where appropriate as well. And um, so 
I think it's an excellent proposal, project, and that um, one just additional factor, it probably pertains to nothing, but then it may pertain to a whole lot too, is that um, the applicant, not only with the background she had with the city and, and city planning, but has a deep interest in Santa Rosa history as she's a member of the uh, Santa Rosa Historical Society or whatever. And I think that plays in this sort of proposal. And so no further comments, but I think you know where I'm gonna go. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Fennell, any comments? My comments mirror my colleagues. Um, it isn't often that we get a project where they're returning the house back to its original state. And this was always an awkward, um, the, the addition was awkward. And I was uh, knew the previous owners and it leaked and was not, it was just not built, you know, the way that it would want to be. And I just applaud them for taking away square footage um, from something that was awkward and, and adding it to someplace else that will befit the neighborhood. Um, we're a single family neighborhood, single, single level homes and, um, and I don't know that I've seen a better project as my time on the board. So I'm all in favor. Board Member McHugh. I echo the uh, comments of my fellow board members, and I also want to add that I really appreciate the historical resource evaluation consistency analysis that you provided. That was very informative to me and helpful in terms of understanding the project and what you want to do. And so I thank you for that. And uh, I'm very supportive of the project, and uh, I am, you know, uh, excited about the, the work you're going to do and the restoration plans that you have, and so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, what what is there to say? It's a, a gorgeous project, a beautiful house to, to begin with, a great canvas to work on, and um, it was a, a real pleasure to look at the materials for this. I loved the, um, the report. It was a fun read, and I loved the uh, thoroughness of the analysis, and uh, sort of the step-by-step -step way that it really considered everything that we uh, need to be asking ourselves as we act on a permit like this and um, the analytical way that everything was dealt with and all of the historic resources were drawn upon uh, and considered um, really um, impressive and yes, unsurprising, but um, shows a lot of respect for the history of the city, which um, you know is also not a surprise, but um, it's the purpose of uh, asking all the questions and uh, those examples of prior work are, are gorgeous and uh, I have every confidence that this one is going to be uh, just as uh, successful and I'm obviously in support. Um, Board Member DeBacher, are there any comments that you would wish to make, uh, maybe requests of the applicant or the applicant's uh, professionals here before I uh, ask for uh, further action. Thank you, Chair. I don't really have any questions. I would uh, have one more comment I was going to run past the board and then perhaps Please. a couple of friendly amendments. Please. Um, uh, something I've, I did not mention before, uh, but I'm just going to bring up, and I, it's not a deal breaker by any stretch, but if you look at the uh, west side yard elevation, if we can get that up on the screen. It's, it's the long side uh, of the, there it is right there, on the west. Uh, the solar panels are arrayed pretty much all along the new addition's uh, western facing roof, including fairly close to the street. And I would just put in a potential friendly amendment to consider relocating some of those panels to the south facing area. Uh, can we get the south elevation up by any chance?
that one I think is the south. The, um, perhaps moving a couple of the panels over to the south, uh, that's not as visible from the street and might offer them higher performance on their solar. That's just an item to consider, not a condition. Um, I would like to put a friendly amendment in for one condition, and that is to retain that uh, address sign in the uh, porch column base for uh, potential future restoration. Uh, can I, uh, does the applicant have any reaction or um, uh, feedback on that potential friendly amendment? I would say we are amenable to that. Um, we don't, I guess I wouldn't say that we can do it with certainty, but to allow the option for us to do it, I think would be fine if uh, Member DeBacher is okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Just to keep the potential open and we'll see what we can do. All right, Are the, the standards uh, require to leave things in place uh, when possible and just uh, if you have to seal it up for now, but leave the workings in place. Um, let's see, I would also consider, um, had two other considers for the friendly amendment. Uh, consider differentiating this uh, siding on the new construction. That's not a condition, that's a consider. Uh, and another one would be, again, not a condition, but a consider uh, relocating the solar panel, some of the solar that closest to the street to the south side south elevation. Go ahead, please. I would just say that as long as that's not a requirement, it's a consideration, we'd be amenable to that as well. Okay. We will talk to our solar provider to um, help us determine the appropriate location for what we need. And I, I have some concern that the south side may also be visible from Brown Street. So we'd want to take a look at that too. But we are certainly, um, aware of the visibility of solar panels and would want to try to shield those as much as possible from the street views, both sides. Okay, thank you. And I, I was going to ask that uh, any changes in windows come to the board, but I've decided we not to proceed with that request. So that's it. So I um, just wanna get some clarification again on the um, the uh, address sign and the manner in which you were interested in, in having that dealt with in terms of the resolution. Um, I'm, are we, has there been a friendly amendment to the resolution? I'm not sure how. Yes, that was that's intended been. as a friendly amendment. In, and could I have the amendment maybe just described back to me to make sure that I'm on the same page? Oops, excuse me. Uh, Unless I missed it, I don't think there is an, a resolution on the table, and if there is, there needs to be a second, and then that needs to go back and be accepted. The friendly amendments need to be accepted by both the person who motioned and seconded. I'm not sure what the um, actual substance of the friendly amendment, how we would restate that in kind of a narrow way. I'm the the person who would, is no, proposing no. that friendly amendment ah. makes that statement, okay, great. and then you go back and if it that happened to be somebody who didn't make the first motion, that's, you go back to <clears throat> that who made the motion and that who made the second. Is that clear? Sure. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm my sorry. apologies. Did, did, uh, commission, did, did uh, Board Member DeBacher make the motion for the resolution? Are you the initiator? No, or, was, Board Member McHugh. McHugh um, made the resolution, it was seconded, okay. and I was offering a friendly amendment to include one condition and two considerations. Right, so you made the uh, amendments clear and then now back to Board Member McHugh to accept and then the, whoever seconded to accept, to, to also accept. And then that motion my, carries for discussion and I, I suppose uh, my question is exactly the, um, the manner in which the, uh, the uh, condition would be written or stated is what that's what I'm unclear about. So um, maybe just if you could restate that or elaborate for my edification. Would you like me to restate? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Please. All right. Uh, the condition is to retain the existing uh, 
column mounted address sign uh, for future restoration. Great, thank you. Good to can, you. can I ask a clarifying question? Was that an if possible? No. But I'm not asking, we're not asking them to restore it today to make up new lights and everything like that. We're asking them to leave the workings that are inside the column uh, in place for potential future restoration. Um, maybe I, I could restate that, I guess, if that was unclear in the original. I think the way you just said it okay. is, is very right. clear. So can I ask you just okay. to do it one more time with that right. so that I understand what it is that I've got to be looking okay. for when I see the plans come in? Okay. To retain the column base mounted light fixture address sign for future restoration. And then there were two considers. The first being differentiating new construction with a different siding or feature. Is that on all on the addition as well as the accessory structure or just on the accessory structure? Thank you for clarifying. Our documents would indicate any new construction, but I was really intending just the new uh, garage and uh, residential unit. And the other one was to consider relocating some of the solar away from uh, which street? Wheeler to the back of the building on the south elevation. Okay. Board Member Tabacher suggested a friendly amendment. The motion uh, was made by Board Member McHugh and seconded by Vice Chair Fennell. Uh, Board Member McHugh, any uh, reaction or discussion or thoughts? No. I uh, would uh, accept the uh, uh, friendly amendment. And uh, Vice Chair? Yes. Okay. I'm fine with that. Okay. So the friendly amendment has been made and uh, board members and staff, any further discussion before I ask for your votes on the uh, motion on the resolution as amended? Okay, uh, staff, would you like the chair to repeat the amendments or I think we've gone over it pretty freshly, so that's probably okay? It's okay. That's great, all right. Okay, um, I'm gonna take a roll call vote on the motion to approve the resolution. Vice Chair Fennell, your vote, please. Aye. Board Member McHugh, your vote, please. Aye. Board Member DeBacher, your vote, please. Heartfelt aye. Board Member Groninga, your vote, please. Aye. And I also vote aye. And that passes five ayes with Board Member Muser being uh, abstaining from that item for very obvious reasons. And with that, uh, we conclude item 6.1. Thank you very much and uh, wonderful to have you back helping us and from another vantage point in the process. Sure, can we take a brief recess? Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's take five and uh, everybody, everybody reset after I actually Say it into a microphone. All right.
guys. I think we are about ready to get that. resume and move to item 6.2 the study session for the downtown station area specific plan update uh, staff presentation uh, mr. Streeter please thank you chair Edmondson members of the cultural heritage board uh, we are here today for a study session regarding the downtown station area specific plan uh, the purpose is to discuss the draft preferred alternative for the plan uh, many of the board members are aware that we do have a, an existing specific plan for our downtown. Um, many board members have seen this slide many times before. Uh, it was adopted in 2007, anticipating the opening of the downtown smart station. It was a 20-year uh, planning period, and part of the vision was around 3,400 new residential units and about half a million square feet of non-residential floor area being developed in response to this new uh, transit center. Uh, we are now more than halfway through the plan period. Um, the, on these two graphs, the bar on the left is what was anticipated. The bar on the right is what was actually constructed. And so you can see, especially for uh, housing development, we've had about 100 units actually built of those 3,400 that were envisioned. Um, so we've fallen short of the um, goals from this plan. Uh, in 2018, the City Council set a series of priorities, and one of those was to, um, to incentivize downtown development and to um, prioritize downtown housing. In response, one of the ways that um, the Planning and Economic Development Department responded was by reaching out to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the MTC, uh, to acquire a planning grant to update our downtown plan um, with the intent of of realizing that vision and also determining whether the vision in 2007 um, is still the vision that the city has today for its downtown. The downtown as we define it is um, different than some people may have in their minds. Um, it includes the downtown core around Courthouse Square as well as Railroad Square, but it also includes several of our, um, our uh, lower intensity residential districts, including six of the, um, the preservation districts in the city. Roughly, um, the downtown area encompasses um, College Avenue to the north, down to Highway 12 on the south, and um, Brookwood on the east, and Dutton on the west. So where are we in this update? The first phase was the deep dive. Um, that was determining what the issues and opportunities were. Uh, There's a lot of background research, but also outreach, um, getting the, the word out that we were, we were taking on this initiative, um, trying to get as much participation as possible. Um, we are now in the alternatives exploration phase. So based on that background research and, and the outreach that we've done, uh, the, the project team developed three alternatives for how this plan could look. Um, those, those went out in front of um, several different groups, um, community members, stakeholder groups, uh, boards and commissions, including this board. Um, and we heard feedback on, on what concepts in each of those three, three, each of those three alternatives um, would, would lead to a successful plan. Um, and that, that feedback was taken in front of our um, technical advisory committee, which is made up of city staff members as well as um, representatives outside agencies to then determine um, which of those concepts that were preferred are also feasible, which can be implemented into a plan. Uh, so based on that, on that feedback um, and then our, our technical advisory committee response, uh, this, the, the project team has put together what's being called the preferred alternative or the preferred plan concept. Um, that is what is before this board today. And the idea is to, to again, get feedback on this, on this concept, make sure that we got the message correctly. Um, again, make sure that it's feasible, make sure we didn't miss anything. Ultimately, to go in front of a joint study session of the City Council and Planning Commission on December 3rd, at which time we would uh, we would take direction from the council. If this preferred plan concept is the way that they'd like to move forward, we will then begin the process of, of implementing that plan. So doing the environmental review, determining the changes that are necessary to our general plan and our zoning code, um, and then in the new year adopting this, this update to the plan um, and having it be the, the law of the land for our downtown area. So the... Um, 
the purpose behind the preferred plan concept is um, kind of, as I said, it's to summarize the consensus that we've heard, to lay out a vision and strategies that we need to implement that vision, um, and also to, to lay out the, the policies and implementing actions that we'll need to take in order to make this plan go from concept to the actual um, plan that's adopted by the council. So during phase one, we, we did receive feedback and context on, on the existing plan and, and what's worked and what hasn't. Um, one thing that we, we did uh, determine through studies of uh, economic feasibility, also um, the, the workforce demand, housing demand, and our, um, our regional housing needs, there's actually capacity for more than 10,000 new units um, just in our downtown, taking advantage of the vacant and underutilized sites that we have. Um, also, a recent development is our downtown core and the Roseland area, which is directly adjacent to the, the downtown plan area, are both what are considered federal opportunity zones. So there's a new financing strategy um, for having development occur in these areas. Um, some of the, the barriers that we've identified from the previous plan um, included a perception that, that it's a, a lengthy review process within the city that permitting is, is not always, um, there's, there's not as much um, confidence in, in moving forward with permitting. And so um, develop, the development community may not even consider Santa Rosa when they can go other places where they don't have to deal with those barriers. Um, in response, the city has um, streamlined the, de the design review process, um, reducing the timeline, also expedited the permitting process um, by using uh, opportunities of um, concurrent review and, um, and setting deadlines to, to, to drop back the, the actual processing time it takes to get a project from concept to building permit. Um, economic barriers to development, obviously um, the plan was adopted in 2007, so the, um, the Great Recession had, a, had an impact on that plan. Um, but now we're, we're past that and we see development occurring um, with much more fervor throughout the Bay Area and not necessarily reflected um, in the North Bay. Um, one of the reasons for that is that the, the multifamily housing market in a downtown area like Santa Rosa is unproven. We don't have many examples of a successful project in our downtown. Um, also the, the development cost versus the return for investment, the construction costs are roughly the same anywhere in the Bay Area but your price per square foot for either rent or sale is much higher in other parts, um, as well as infrastructure costs. Um, there's uh, the utilities, as well as the um, overhead power lines throughout the city. Those are just added costs that, that all work into a pro forma for a project that have been making it uh, more difficult to have the development up here that we envisioned in our plan. Um, some of the strategies include um, as I mentioned before, the response of, of reducing those, those costs and timelines. Uh, the department has also looked at our fees and, and reduced, uh, given uh, methods of reducing the fees that a, that a project would take on. Um, also trying to make a, a more attractive downtown and that's part of the vision for this downtown plan update. Um, also looking at the, the job sector where we have um, jobs that, that can support housing and also um, taking advantage of that and letting the, the industry leaders know that we we want to work with them in, in providing the housing for, for their, uh, their job sources. Um, and then also just expanding the, the downtown, having more rooftops, having proven projects that can, that can set an example and, and uh, act as a catalyst for, for future development. Uh, regulatory barriers also exist. Um, as I mentioned before, there were considerations of, of strict development uh, requirements, um, also in addition to being restrictive, they've been uh, considered complicated. There were um, seven different sub areas in the previous plan, as well as seven different street types. Um, so any project moving forward would have to identify which uh, sub area they were, which street type they were under, as well as their zoning district, their general plan designation. Um, and it just created confusion and made it difficult for a, uh, for a developer to even know what they could do with their, with their parcel. So in response to these barriers, uh, part of the, the, the plan for this update is obviously the, the objective is to facilitate housing production. We wanna simplify the development standards. We wanna provide flexibility. Um, one, one thing that, that came up is that we don't know what 
technology is going to look like, what market demand is going to look like several years from now. So we'd like to build in that flexibility so that we're able to, um, even, even development uh, types that we can't anticipate now, we'll be able to have a place for them should they, should they arise. Um, and then also creating a, a, a sense of place, giving an identity to our downtown. Which brings us to the preferred plan concept. Um, just to give a couple comments on the outreach that was performed, um, we've had over 800 different um, points of contact as far as developing this uh, this draft plan concept. Uh, our most recent workshop, where we looked at the, the three alternatives, had 120 uh, plus participants show up at the the central library branch. Uh, we've had a wide response to our online surveys. And, um, and as I mentioned, we've, we've gotten a lot of very, very good feedback on what concepts people preferred from our different plans, which we were able to take in front of our technical advisory committee uh, to determine feasibility. Um, so some of the points of consensus, um, there was a, a lot of support for a dense urban core around Courthouse Square as well as the concept of uh, village centers. So as I mentioned uh, on the earlier slide, the downtown area is actually a, a very wide, um, expansive area. And so the feedback we got was that intensity should be concentrated in our downtown core, but we should create a sense of place um, through all these different neighborhoods, both existing and uh, potentially future neighborhoods that develop. Um, there was also a lot of support for connectivity through the Santa Rosa Plaza Mall. Uh, right now, the existing plan has uh, calls for a road, a, an automobile road plus sidewalks to be punched through at 4th Street. Um, the feasibility of that is it's private property, so um, if the owners of the mall were to have a major redevelopment, that would be a requirement. However, um, there's been a lot of support um, and, and comfort with the idea of just having bike and or pedestrian uh, connection through. Uh, which would maybe mean uh, sm a, a more minor retrofit of the mall property and um, perhaps extended hours, something like that, rather than a wholesale demolition of a portion of the mall to, to construct a street. Uh, Santa Rosa Creek has been identified as a key asset in our downtown, so orienting development towards the creek and, and improving wayfinding and the actual creek facilities uh, to encourage use. Um, some sort of connectivity as far as a, a trolley or, or utilizing our existing city bus uh, facilities to create connectivity between the different parts of our downtown. Um, and then also just the catalyst sites that were mentioned previously. So um, Maxwell Court, which is in the, the northeast portion or northwest portion of the downtown area, um, has been home to Bodine, uh, the asphalt plant for a long time. Bodine has, has uh, expressed interest in, in leaving that location, which creates a, a, a catalyst site. Um, also, there's in our down core, downtown core, there are uh, several city-owned facilities, um, some of them in, in uh, stages of, of needing substantial maintenance to them. So those are properties that could be leveraged towards a, uh, a public-private partnership that could then give us some of those, those catalytic projects that prove the market for future projects. Um, so as I mentioned, it was the, the idea was a, a big city urban core these uh, neighborhood centers and, and improving the connectivity between them all, um, enhancing our, our streetscape. So the, pre the existing plan calls for ground floor uses. Um, the, the going strategy for mixed use has always been uh, retail on the ground floor, residential above. Uh, we know that, that in the, the changing retail dynamic now, um, that's not always going to be successful. So. Um, so while an active use like a, a retail or a, or a service industry location on the ground floor is acceptable, uh, we're also opening the idea to de design changes that could activate the streetscape for development. Um, improving our, our streetscapes and connectivity, so not just um, through restriping or building new streets, but improving wayfinding, incorporating art and lighting to, to make um, the pedestrian, bicycle, and automobile experience uh, more pleasant through our different connections. Um, and then also identifying areas where, where new development or redevelopment could occur. And so in, in coming up with this, this plan concept, we did isolate certain areas of the city that, that have the most potential for development. Uh, so the, the slide that's up right now, 
uh, shows vacant land, underutilized land, and, and city property. Um, the under underutilized land is where the the value of the of the ground is higher than the value of the building that's sitting on it. Uh, so these are all areas where we have clusters of these different types of opportunities uh, that we've identified for areas where potential change could happen. And you'll see in the um, in the plan where we we talk about new land uses and and new design uh, or new new regulatory framework, we try we tend to concentrate in these areas where we see the most potential for development. Uh, you'll probably notice that most of the um, preservation districts are outside of these areas, uh, or if they, they do encroach into these uh, change areas, it's usually along a major corridor or an area where there, there is potential for, um, for substantial development or redevelopment. Uh, but one thing that we do want to be very sensitive to is that these are transition areas moving from the high intensity um, downtown core or these these new development areas into these established preservation districts. So that's um, that's a portion where where this board will be very uh, useful as a resource as we try to develop how those transitions occur. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the the plan concept before you envisions the the majority of our of our development and intensity in this downtown core around Courthouse Square. This is where we'd see the tallest buildings, also the um, the highest number of residential units, in addition to other types of um, of land uses, so uh, the, the workforce centers and um, and the cultural institutions. Uh, but we also want to elevate these village centers, so um, different neighborhoods would have high connectivity between them, and also some sort of focal point, uh, like a park or a plaza or a civic space, that gives them identity and, and helps everyone kind of focus uh, Around around a certain part of the of these different neighborhoods, um, so we did simplify the land uses that we're looking at um, for the downtown area. The um, pre the 2007 downtown plan had 13 different land use designations. Uh, we've narrowed it down to six, um, and they they each um, there's there's four um, main new land uses that we'll be incorporating into this plan. They are core mixed use, station mixed use, maker mixed use, and neighborhood mixed use. You may see a running theme between those different land uses. The idea is if providing flexibility. Um, so we want them to be permissive. We want them to, to allow a neighborhood to develop organically as, as different types of uses come in. We don't want to be saying no. We want to be working towards yes. Um, and so the, what differentiates them is, is pretty much the target um, audience or, or target um, users of them. So core mixed use, that, that is our, our big city downtown core. It's the most permissive, it's the highest intensity, and it also, it's, it's where our workforce is primarily going, it's where um, the most, most of our dense dwelling units will be. Our station mixed use land use is meant to cater primarily to visitors. So um, Railroad Square is the, is the main focal point of that, and that's that's what's bringing people into the city. That's where, where people that are in the city are going to go out or to um, have a cultural experience. Uh, but it also does support residential. So um, the smart site is a great example of a, a site where we'd have those visitor serving uses as well as people that are living there taking advantage of transit. Maker mixed use is, um, it's meant to take advantage of, of in a lot of cases, existing um, development, so uh, Maxwell Court in the, the Northwest is, is uh, kind of a, a good example of that. Right now it's, it's developed with some pretty successful and established industrial uses. We don't want to drive those uses away. We don't want to tell them that they're, they're not an allowed use there, but we do want to allow the potential for um, if a property owner wants to redevelop, if they want to add um, residential that would accompany their industrial use. Uh, that, that's where maker mixed use comes in. There are examples of it um, throughout the Bay Area, but we just took a field trip earlier today to the warehouse district in Petaluma. Uh, that's, that's kind of the, the vision that we're looking, looking at where you have um, distilleries, you have some auto-oriented uses, um, you also have medium to high density housing, um, and they all exist next to each other and it's very walkable. Um, and you just, um, as, as properties are developed, they have consideration of the existing uses around them and, and plan accordingly. Uh, and lastly, our neighborhood mixed use, that is where the other ones I, I mentioned were job-centric, industrial-centric, visitor-centric, that is our resident-centric 
mixed use district. So that's the one that's supposed to uh, primarily be residential with uh, neighborhood serving uses allowed in that, that type of area. Um, as this map also includes urban park and civic spaces. Um, so in our existing general plan, we have a little tree icon that you'll, you'll see in different places indicating that a park is necessary. What we've observed in the past is that each parcel in that area will develop until one person is left uh, being the one that has to build that park. So we're trying to be a little more permissive here and, and saying that these are the types of uses we wanna see. And it doesn't have to be a city park that's built there. It could be um, private space that's that's activated and enabled so that um, it's private space, but it's it's publicly accessible and publicly usable. Um, so we're, we're still kind of developing what that definition looks like, but that's the idea behind the urban park civic space designation. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are opportunities for catalyst sites um, to, to really prove the market and, and start uh, having the development that we'd like to see. Another big change with this preferred plan concept is moving away from the traditional units per acre and, um, and development standards. So you can have eight units per acre and your building height maximum is 35 feet. Instead, we, we're, we're moving towards the concept of floor area ratio. Uh, to put it very simply, whatever this ratio is, is the amount of building that you can, you can construct. So if you have a 1,000 square foot parcel and your floor area ratio is one, you can do a one story, 1,000 square foot building that would take up the entire parcel, or you can do a two, th two story, 500 square foot per floor building um, that would then take up half the parcel. So it regulates by form and mass as opposed to by, um, by straight uh, units per acre and um, rigid development standards. So it allows for more flexibility in how, how concepts move forward. Uh, this would be coupled with uh, requirements such as step backs, transition requirements, um, open space requirements that prevent us from having overwhelming monolithic development. Uh, but it does create that flexibility that, that as a project can be designed and molded to actually fit the site. Uh, so you'll see that the areas where we're proposing to implement this FAR system uh, roughly overlaps with the, the new land use areas, which overlaps with those, um, those development potential areas. Uh, again, the, the highest intensity, highest FAR would be located in our core, um, and then it would feather down as we approach the preservation districts and as we approach the, um, the, ex the boundaries of the, of the downtown plan area. Uh, as I mentioned, there, there would be design considerations also taken into account. Uh, so this map that's on the screen right now, uh, those arrows along the bottom portion of the, of the plan area, that's indicating that development would be required to uh, front the creek or at least acknowledge the creek uh, to activate the existing trail that we have there. Um, we'd also, we'd have these transition edges. So uh, most applicable to this board would be our na neighborhood transition edge uh, where we have higher intensity development that is transitioning into our lower intensity preservation districts. And so we'd like to develop zoning standards around how that actually takes place. And as I mentioned before, we, we are no longer requiring active ground floor uses, it's active ground floor uh, active ground floor requirements. So that could be accomplished through design, through land use, um, or through other creative means. And connectivity is a, a key component of this plan. Uh, as I mentioned, connection through the, the mall area, um, we'd like to see that, that connectivity um, and improvement uh, travel all the way from 4th Street in Courthouse Square to 4th Street in Railroad Square across the tracks down to Santa Rosa Creek. Um, there are other areas where there's opportunities for streetscape and enhancement um, that would again improve the experience for users of the street. Um, road diets is another concept that came out of our, our outreach. The idea for road diet is you take away a vehicle travel lane and you give that real estate to other types of improvements which could include parklets, uh, bicycle lanes or bikeways or um, sidewalk improvements. 
And so the, the key takeaways from this, this plan that's before you, it's, uh, it's bold and there are some, some substantial changes from the existing 2007 plan. One of them is, is implementing this, this use of FAR. Um, another that, um, that we'd like to implement is to waive the parking requirements for development within a quarter mile of high frequency transit. Uh, so much of the downtown does have access to high frequency transit. So this would be a, a major change as well. Um, that, that active ground floor requirement that I mentioned, um, trying to, to leverage um, opportunities that we have for, for catalyst sites to develop, um, enabling public spaces, be it private or public, um, and improving the wayfinding and, and street experience. And so um, with that, I'd like to, we'd, we'd love to hear feedback from this board um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Streeter. Um, I do um, have a card on this. It's not a uh, formal public hearing, but I think we'd be happy to hear uh, comments from any members of the public who are here and then we'll jump in uh, as a board and ask questions. Uh, so I do have one card on the item from uh, Michelle Gervais. And hi. Uh, hi, thank you so much. I'm sorry I missed the beginning, but I had the benefit of getting to meet with Patrick earlier today. And um, I'm here on behalf of the Santa Rosa Canners. I'm not sure if you're familiar, all familiar with them. Uh, John Stewart is the lead partner of a few. He bought the um, property along the creek in Railroad Square. You, you know the walls that remain along the SMART site. Those are the cannery properties that were purchased 20 years ago, actually. Um, it's quite a saga for another time, but I wanted, as it's relevant for today, I just wanted to speak on behalf and say that we have been uh, retooling the project, which had originally been entitled in 2008 for 93 condos. It is now intended to be 114 affordable housing units, mixed income, mixed age, between 30 and 80 percent affordability. Uh, maintaining the historic, that the arrangement that was made with um, your predecessors was that the historic walls that contribute to the historic district be maintained. And they have been, there's a laser site from Carlisle Macy that's been monitoring that now for almost 20 years. Uh, very little movement at all, which is great. Also that the water tower be eventually restored and replaced. Um, you may or may not know that the buildings had been uh, connected and there had been a, a fruit and packing distribution line that rang between the two buildings. Part of these earlier plans back in the 08 entitlement was that that four street corridor be opened up so that the passageway through to the creek could, could be recreated from ages ago. And, uh, and so there is a dedicated uh, public right-of-way that will be uh, negotiated as part of the project. And there's actually a storm drain that was replaced there after one um, New Year's Eve uh, drenching of Railroad Square. It's another story, but there was a, a skew uh, sewer line that was crushed with the moving of the water tower by such a heavy crane truck. And nobody knew until New Year's Eve when there was a big storm and it backed up in the restaurants, that was something. In any case, that Fourth Street corridor is another element that is part of this proposed project. And suffice it to say that after looking at the previous plan, or the current plan, and this uh, preferred plan concept, um, we find that this is a terrific, terrific plan. It allows the flexibility for other sites. It enables this catalytic project. And the floor error ratio, is a, a really exciting way to have some versatility and height or scale as is appropriate for a site and neighbors. In this instance, there are two parcels and the northern of the two, which is the blue banded plant five, we don't propose much development right now, it'd be a community space. And that is because we wouldn't have the West Street along the smart site to provide access to that building for housing. Our floor area numbers are a bit askew, but they do have, we think, the um, recognizably special condition that would make that FAR not quite fit for the entirety of the site with the acknowledgement that when West Street is in place, that northern building could be developed with more housing. And so 
the bottom line is we look forward to submitting for entitlements very soon. It's a financing issue for affordable housing that's tricky, but this all does fit and we applaud the great effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's always been one of my favorite sites in the city. It's always been fascinated, fascinating to me and it's at the confluence of so many other things and uh, highly visible and uh, it's exciting to hear about all the plans. So thanks for coming and uh, telling us about that. Uh, I think that's the only, uh, it's the only card I have and so I'm just gonna bring it back uh, to the board and uh, ask for any comments or excuse me, uh, questions first for staff and uh, board member Groninga, uh, if you would like to start or if you have any questions for staff. I have no questions for staff at this point, so. You want me to wait on comments later then? Uh, certainly, of course. Um, I'll just open it up then. Uh, any questions for staff before we just go to uh, comments on the uh, preferred alternative? Board Member McHugh, question for staff? No, no questions. Okay. Uh, Board Member DeBacher. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, looking uh, at uh, some of the floor area ratios in their relationship to the, uh, the numerous historic districts that uh, are forming adjacencies here. And uh, <clears throat> there, do, there does seem to be some substantial increase in floor area ratios on some of our, our most precious uh, portions of our downtown and, and other areas. Um, uh, for example, the railroad square, well, let's go with 4th Street downtown. Uh, going with an 8.0 floor area ratio for uh, some of those wonderful old buildings that are already along fourth. Um, is, is it really the expectation that um, we would be tearing out that uh, section of town and, and going bigger? Let's start with that question first. Yeah, so it's, the expectation is not that established historic buildings would be torn down to allow monstrosities to take their place. Um, but we, we do want to allow the, the possibility that, for instance, along 4th, there are several parking lots on the 5th the Street side mm -hmm. of those buildings. So we'd like to allow the possibility that buildings could take place that would be high intensity, um, but they would still be subject to, if there is a historic building on the site, um, all of the Secretary of Interior standards um, potentially going in front of this board for, for comment on, on what's being proposed. Um, and uh, yes, preservation of our existing streetscapes is a, is a key component of this plan. So the historic character of, of Forest Street and many of our areas downtown, uh, preserving that or, or making sure that that's acknowledged would be a key component of any new development. I would also add, yeah. um, the exhibit that talks about design considerations, you'll see these little red triangles called downtown transition edge, and that's exactly to capture that sensitivity point that Forest Street has character, special, special characteristics that we'd wanna make sure that we don't lose um, by increasing, as uh, Mr. Streeter said, the opportunity to build behind them or with them. Could, could you put that slide up by any chance? I'm not seeing it in the... Uh little triangles that you're referring to on. So you can see here um, the sort of black hatch is the street active, active ground floor, okay. but you see on the left here, we have different transition edges mm -hmm. um, depending on what we're really sensitive to. So we've identified ones where it has that downtown classic Santa Rosa Main Street characteristic we wanna preserve. Um, also <clears throat> areas around the smart station itself and then the neighborhood transition is, is that which is speaking to a preservation district, frankly. Okay, that, that clarifies some things a bit because those streetscapes are something that I was, had a bit of a problem in sacrificing for the floor area designations that were being um, done with those. And it may be useful to clarify that the floor area ratios apply to open sites um, uh, I'd also want to make sure that it's understood uh, something that this board has been saying for a while is our last survey was 1988. And so there are um, uh, 50 years more buildings that haven't been evaluated yet. Uh, and with the loss of certain other buildings due to fires and other things, 
some of which we had a few of before, we're down to one now. Uh, and I would, uh, I think it, uh, a new survey needs to go hand in hand uh, with establishing what's important. Uh, we're, we're a little bit long of tooth on that. Um, I'm, there's also some encroachment going on on the Cherry Street uh, area in the orchard um, that I, I know I'm going to probably be hearing from some of our constituents about. Um, I think you've addressed one of the other ones that was my concern about the station area itself with the wonderful uh, bluestone buildings uh, being in the designated uh, density increase area. I don't think anybody's looking forward to losing the depot or Hotel La Rose or the Flying Goat uh, for this. So uh, if there's some way to show that being excluded as we move forward in some way, uh, I think would be a prudent. Um, I'll just think I'll just leave it at that. I think that we, we need to support the plan with an, a pl at least plans for an updated survey. Uh, and that if there, there are certain portions like the depot area itself and uh, some of our, uh, our urban street fronts that already are functioning that we don't want to lose. I'll leave it at that. And uh, Chair Edmonton, if I may just respond to uh, to Board Member DeBacher's comments about the survey. Of course. Uh, so we do have, as part of the scope of this project, um, to engage, it's not going to be a wholesale historic inventory survey of, of the properties in the downtown, uh, but we are looking to expand the scope slightly to include um, surveys of, of certain priority development sites uh, to identify where we do have historic resources that may have become age eligible in the, the 30 plus years since the last survey took place. Uh, as a department, we are also looking for other um, funding sources to expand that survey out to cover mo more of our um, downtown area. Wherever we are not able to accomplish that as part of our proactive planning, it would be uh, on a future developer to actually do that, that research and identify whether there is a historic resource on site and to uh, take the, the necessary steps that, that would involve. And just as another follow-up to that, so we, uh, we have uh, organized around uh, some SB2 funds with the state and we, are, we have uh, multiple initiatives we'd like to, to move forward, but a primary one is to do historic survey work in the downtown area, um, focus on these, these developable, so outside the preservation districts, but these sort of catalytic areas and do that survey work up front. Um, so we are hoping to submit that grant later this month and we hope to get that those funds to move forward with that. Chair, Chair if I could add one more thing. Of course. Um, oh, another reason for encouraging the survey is that just in the last week or so, the governor signed uh, the renewal of historic uh, tax credits for historic properties. The more properties we can get surveyed and on our local listings, the more of our community can benefit from that 15% tax credit uh, as we help move forward with this. So it, it, it's extra money to leverage the improvement of our downtown if we act in a way that allows our historic buildings to participate. Board Member Muser, any questions for staff? So if, if I heard correctly and I've, I've read correctly, it doesn't sound like, I guess it's just yes or no, it doesn't sound like there's gonna be um, land use changes in the historic districts. It is not simple yes or no. Um, okay. For the most part, the majority of the, of the preservation districts, there are no changes proposed, but there are certain areas, um, particularly along uh, major arterials or other areas that fall within those um, places that I had identified earlier as um, opportunity areas. Some of those do have the historic designation uh, overlay, so there, there is encroachment into some of these areas where there would be changes to land use and to uh, development uh, standards. Okay, thank you. Get a look at some of these exhibits as we're trying to highlight where the area of change is. So that's where you see the, sort of that bold coloring coming up through these exhibits. Where you don't see any bold change, there's no proposed change. So we're not proposing to change the land use or the, um, uh, the zoning for those. And so if that helps, 
navigate through these exhibits where you don't see any bold color, there's no proposed change. It sounds like it might be useful for this board if we were to develop an exhibit that showed the boundaries of our preservation districts and where the change would occur. So that's something that we can do. It doesn't sound as though there was a mistake. I mean, that it, it seems like it was obvious then that Cherry was left off of the um, neighborhood transition edge. Was that as one of these affected areas back into College Avenue? Is that purposely left off, as Mark had mentioned? Is it, I know yeah. we've seen projects come before us that are proposed for that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the the core of Cherry Street is not, the area that surrounds it, it does not have any change proposed. Uh, but that is a good point that there are, there are areas on the edge of the, of the preservation district that would also be fronting with these uh, higher intensity FAR districts. So that, that's a good point that we can, we can look further into. I have a couple of questions. Please, or were you gonna say something, Board Member McHugh? Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, getting caught in a in a bit of a vice in terms of of what our responsibilities are vis-a-vis -vis the the desire of the city to build more housing and to and to you know increase uh, increase densities. Uh, we've had uh, we had a, a project here a couple months ago that was on College Avenue, and although that technically wasn't in, I think the St. Rose historical district, it did have it, it, it shadowed it in some fashion. And so, I'd like you know I hope that that there is some flexibility in terms of, in, I mean, an education program or something that will will advise developers on what the implications are of their designs and their structures relative to, uh, you know, historical districts, even though they may technically not be in one, but be very close to one. That's a concern I have. Uh, is, was that a more of a comment or a question? I just don't want to interrupt. Well, it's, it's a comment. As a comment, so that's why I did not respond. But okay. we are we are noting that comment. Thank you. Okay. Board Member DeBacher. Just one more along the lines of uh, uh, John's comment. Uh, the um, at, at my earlier stages when I was here 11 years ago, one of our mandates was when we were looking at the effects and, and Section 106 as well. When we do that, when you're looking at the effect on a historic property. Our language at that time that we were working under was uh, projects in and adjacent to historic districts. So all the properties that were immediately adjacent to the outline to a historic uh, district boundary also required review, though it was mostly in view sheds and, and height. I don't know whether that language still exists in the documents of in or adjacent to in our documentation. But it's something we ought to make sure we take another look at, whether that's uh, a conflict or uh, a potential conflict with where we're going here. I have a couple of questions if I can jump in. Um, so the, the switch to the FAR expression of uh, you know, the density concept. Um, I'm looking back at the, you know, the uh, three alternatives the last time and I don't know, was FAR um, discussed much in those alternatives? Um, it's, I, I'm sort of just seeing how it's um, become a, an overlay um, and a pretty powerful tool here and, and I'm just wondering um, when that started to pick up Steam and become a, a way that people thought it would express the wishes of, you know, that surrounded three plans that didn't, may not have discussed it. Included as, um, 
as a concept in those three alternatives that, that went out. Uh, we were talking about the, the comfort with building height and, and mass and shadows and things like that. Uh, the FAR concept actually came as feedback from members of the development community as well as our, um, our consultants on how to, how to address the, the concerns about flexibility and about um, regulating a building based on form rather than rigid design standards. So it was, it was the, the outreach that took place after we released those alternatives that the FAR concept came into this project. Okay. Um, I, I'm, FAR, you know, it's been, I guess, growing in prominence and uh, in the Bay Area and elsewhere. And um, it's just a, a little bit surprising to me to see it come in at this stage of the process and not have been in the first stage of it. And um, when I suppose, you know, because it's a well-known planning tool, even though it's a, a sea change, um, I think it might be surprising to some people to see it uh, as uh, part of a preferred alternative when it wasn't in any of the other uh, alternatives, especially since it's kind of, I think, a new concept for the city. And uh, I think a lot of people are probably going to be doing a lot of uh, learning about the pros and cons of what the built environment looks like and how it performs when we have an FAR type system. And uh, I uh, am not sure that uh, it's going to be understood um, or, or people are going to be very comfortable um, with having to learn that in connection with this process. But um, let's see if I have any other questions before we turn it to comments. Oh, um, I remember somewhat from, from this board, but certainly from, I think, the, the City Council and the Planning Commission, there was quite a bit of um, weight thrown behind the Roberts Avenue underpass, and that was part of two of the uh, three alternatives, I think, that were around before. And it was part of the circulation plan in the, in the second alternative, and it looks like the circulation plan for the second alternative was almost adopted wholesale for this preferred alternative with minor uh, differences here and there. Um, I am just wondering why uh, something that seemed like it had quite a bit of support, um, just as much support as some of the ones that were uh, described in the, uh, you know, the slide that you had about what people were interested in and what feedback you got from the stakeholders and, and the government, why uh, that wasn't part of the preferred alternative? So the, um, the message that we heard, uh, there were, we've, we've heard feedback from the Planning Commission um, and, and the other boards and, 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 uh, and committees and, um, and council did support that underpass. Um, but what we, we really heard was that it was um, supporting the connection of the Roberts Avenue area to the, the rest of the plan area. Um, and that was also the feedback that we got from the public was that some connection has to take place. Um, also, it has to be a, a feasible alternative and the existing um, space that's in the, the right of way that in the existing plan is proposed for, uh, it's not feasible to actually construct that uh, vehicular road. Um, there is the option of, of constructing a new tunnel underneath Highway 12 and connecting Roberts Avenue, but that also includes uh, working with Caltrans, getting the, the funding to do that, that connection, and also on the other side of the street, or on the other side of the freeway on the north end of Highway 12, uh, would be uh, acquisition of, of private property to, to build that road. So based on the feedback that we heard, um, it was less so about the vehicular connection than it was through establishing a connection. Um, so in the preferred plan concept that's before you, uh, it, there's a lot of um, offsite that would be associated with any kind of development that took place in the Roberts Ave area to create that clear connection between um, this area, Roseland, and the, the station area. So we're, we're responding to that both through land use um, so you'll find that the, the station mixed use land use has been applied to the Roberts Avenue area, um, but also this roadway enhancement uh, for Sebastopol Road as well as Olive Street and Railroad Street and the pedestrian bicycle connection uh, clearly connecting the station to this area. So that was the response um, 
based both on the comfort level and the, the desire that we heard from uh, our various forms of outreach, as well as the feasibility when we went in front of our technical boards. So the um, connections from the Roseland area, or excuse me, the uh, Roberts area, uh, to the station area would be, in terms of how they might be different from what they are now, it would be an enhancement of, to the, um, the uh, bike path there, the uh, smart path. It would be, it looks like an enhancement to the bus service that would go over to Dutton and up to Third Street. And it would be this, um, Olive Street enhancement of some sort, and that Olive Street and Dutton would would remain the vehicular easiest and yeah, chosen those, those ways would be the that two people vehicular would travel. Connections, yes, and um, and you're probably familiar with the the underpass right now at Olive, where it meets Sebastopol Road, or I guess Sebastopol Avenue at that point, uh, is not very pedestrian friendly. Um, so it would be include the pedestrian improvements. Um, just the the streetscape improvements that would that make that a, a desirable place, and the wayfinding to make to make it clear that there is a connection there uh, for vehicles as well as these these other uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities. So um, it would be fair to say maybe that the Olive Street area would be uh, more of a, th a through fare uh, were this to be the plan going forward because we would be increasing the density quite a bit in Roberts and we would be seeking to tie it to the rest of the plan area and the shortest vehicular path of travel and uh, the uh, most sort of normal connection uh, would be Olive Street and would bisect that district. Uh, that's a fair assumption. Okay. A uh, couple other questions. Um, like I said a minute ago, the um, looks like the circulation plan was mostly based on alternative two. There were a couple of things that were a little different and I was just curious about why. Um, the road diets, um, Mendocino Avenue, the road diet had been, I think, all the way up to the north, um, all the way either to Lincoln or College or, you know, basically to the, the edge of the plan area. And, um, you know, we've been talking about that um, neighborhood a couple of times so far here. And uh, now the road diet appears to end at 10th, leaving that. Um, north end of Mendocino Avenue the way that it is currently. Uh, so I was wondering why that was not adopted. And I have the same question with regard to the stretch of Santa Rosa Avenue between Sonoma and First Street, which was to be part of the road diet, but now is no longer described as being part of it. Yeah, those, uh, those changes came from, uh, again, our technical advisory committee meeting. Uh, so these road diets are actually in our bike and pedestrian master plan as well as our, um, our CIP. So this reflects the actual road diets that will be taking place um, per our, our um, Transportation Public Works Department. The, 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 the further portions of it were deemed not feasible and that's why, that's why the, the segments that you see reflected here are what, were, what would actually be implemented in the CIP. Okay. And, and somewhere there's, um, is there a publicly available resource um, that describes why those wouldn't have been feasible? Would it be part of the bike and pedestrian master plan or um, some technical document? Because um, I'm just curious personally why it's not feasible between 10th and college. Yeah, we can, we can follow up on that and, and determine if there is, if it is memorialized somewhere. Okay, thanks. Uh, board members, any other questions for staff? And then we'll um, just make a round and make comments. Vice Chair Fennell. Will this be affecting um, the Cultural Heritage Board's um, ability to have input on, like say Santa Rosa Avenue and some of these areas that are in the high um, ratio uh, Areas will we have? Will we still have the same say so that we have now, or will we lo be losing part the, of our? It's the former. Uh, so we are we are changing the land uses and development standards, but the um, the oversight and the purview of this board does not change. So the, the we're not changing anywhere any locations with the um, the dash H historic overlay, 
and um, the additional findings for say uh, one of the one of the items that goes before this board is increased building height. Um, anything in a preservation district over um, 35 feet or two stories, uh, this board needs to make findings that it's um, consistent with the surrounding neighborhood. Those will remain in full force and effect with this plan. Okay, uh, let us wrap up. Uh, board member DeBacher, would you like to kick it off and make any final comments that you have? I, I apologize, I made most of my comments already during the question phase. No need to apologize. I, I'll add one more though, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is, this is just something to bear in mind in the background. Paris is considered to be among the most livable and functioning urban places uh, in the world. Uh, Paris operates because it has a five foot, five story height limit. Paris couldn't exist if it used floor area ratio. It would be a very different, very, very different place with gaps between the buildings and inconsistent storefronts. It's the five story height limit that does make certain, or height limits in general that make certain urban spaces work. Uh, I'm not saying that floor area ratio can't, but I will say that it will take an extra effort to make uh, the street sense of an area ruled by floor area ratio um, be a very successful urban space. Board member DeBacher, any comments? Or excuse me, board member DeBacher. Board member uh, Muser, any uh, comments? The, um, <clears throat> the land use designations, even, even today, um, in certain areas in the historic uh, districts have put us in positions where the applicant, um, based on the land use, is applying to do something, but based on fitting in with the historic neighborhood, doesn't fit. So it, it causes kind of a conflict. Um, so any land use changes, and, and I say this in two ways because in, in, on one side, there's some real opportunity um, in some of the historic neighborhoods, uh, such as West End and uh, Railroad Square. Um, but it, it will be, with, with land use changes in the historic neighborhoods, it will also potentially cause us conflict as uh, at least I see my role as um, um, supporting those people who have invested in the historic neighborhoods and are counting on the city to preserve those historic neighborhoods and keep them as, as they were uh, designated initially. So anyway, just my thoughts. Um, board Member Gronica. I was going to say Board Member Muser just to keep it going, but uh, Board Member Gronica. Um, just a few comments. Uh, and the first one, some terms, I guess, jump out at me on this. Uh, and they kind of relate also to past and current roles I find myself in as uh, soon as I assume uh, Chairman Edmondson would find himself in too. One is vibrancy. I really like where the direction of where you're trying to go and uh, in terms of uh, the downtown area, the specific plans and so on, it's much needed. Uh, and it also then relates to transition that we are in need, I suppose, uh, of transition to, again, ensure that vibrancy and increased housing to meet those demands. Um, switching to my uh, cultural heritage board hat, it also 
uh, calls out for a delicate balance that we're, as a board, will be faced with. Um, and I think that's why we probably are getting, and some of the questions in my own mind is, you know, what is our role going to be inadvertently or uh, as stated by, say, current regulations or policy, it's going to be potential conflict for us, I guess, uh, which I think we probably all are aware of. Yet at the same time, I don't think as a cultural heritage board member that we can, in essence, shy away from that and that uh, we may need some assistance or guidance as to what the city may want to clarify for us on policy or have uh, engage us in whether we think we need some changes and certainly as you've already indicated thing about the land use changes on the edges of those uh, on some of those districts will be important um, having said that um, I really think we do need to keep moving forward on this and that I would assume unless policy or regulations change that whether we for the Cultural Heritage Board approves or disapproves a project, the next step to for the uh, proposal, the developer proposing a project, whatever it is, is that they'll appeal us, potentially people could appeal us to what, the next level, the uh, planning commission, and then it gets appealed to perhaps and approved by the city council. Is that what we're going to be seeing in the future? An appeal of a CHB action would go directly to council. To council, okay. Okay, thank you for reminding me. But I think we need to be aware of that is, is what I'm saying, so. With that, I'll shut up and keep moving forward. Yeah. And Board Member McHugh, any comments? It seems to me that we're going to have a, 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 some issues around height. Uh, even in the core downtown, a, a 10-story building or a, or a 12-story building uh, will have an impact on, on the uh, surrounding cultural uh, districts in a sense that, that they will create a shadow or they'll do something. That, so I think that there has to be some kind of, of understanding or some education that allows us to, to be able to, to deal with that. Because I think, you know, the city is, is really on the cusp of transitioning from a town to a city and all of the implications that go with that. And so I'm concerned that we do, or you do, uh, an education program that kind of gets people to start to understand what that transition is, and what it's gonna look like. I know this plan is part of that, but the vast majority of the citizens in the city probably don't really understand it or know very little about it. So your education program, I think, is critical to start to get people out beyond the stakeholders that usually show up at these kinds of events. So that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair Fennell, any comments? Well, for our purview being historic districts, historically FAR has been a great thing and has worked well for historic districts that are very well established, high end, but has had a bad impact on lesser established districts um, where parking concerns can be a problem. Um, with the huge, you know, with huge buildings that don't have the parking needs and we can, look to the future and hope that we're gonna have everybody riding a smart train and riding their bicycle or an electric scooter or the transit, but we're not there yet. And we need to be thoughtful with the way that we move forward with the close proximity of these historic districts because 
if we move too fast and we build too tall and there's not enough parking because we are hoping and planning that people are going to move around the way that we're hoping that they're going to move around, we're going to destroy resources and we're going to have people losing home values. And I just think we need to be careful with these districts um, that would be impacted by parking and um, you know, it's a great idea to say we're not we're going to take away the parking restrictions in these areas because we really want to see organically what's going to happen in this district. But organically, you know, is a good theory, <laughs> but it doesn't always it doesn't always pencil out. And um, so, I, along with my colleagues, I just think we need to be careful. We need to be thoughtful in our processes along Santa Rosa Avenue, along. Cherry and, and Mendocino and um, and actually all of our districts that are going to be impacted by this. They just it needs to be done very thoughtfully and with um, and with a lot of thoughtful in, input from the neighborhoods and see what they want to do. Because I, I agree with John. We've talked to people and we've had meetings and you know some stuff, but there have been neighborhoods that haven't been as involved with their uh, community liaisons as other neighborhoods have. And um, but moving forward, I do think that in, in these, you know, let's talk to our neighbors in these historic districts. As a, as a committee and as a, as a group, we need to represent them and know what plans they have. So that's all I have. Chair Edmondson, if I may just make a clarifying comment earlier, um, when I mentioned one of the key moves is to eliminate the parking requirements, um, it is eliminating the city's parking requirement on a project. Uh, most developments have some sort of parking that they are, they, in order to get finance, they have to provide parking. Um, it is the real world. It's not, we're not everybody's bicycling and riding, riding transit. Uh, so most projects will include parking. We just don't want to be the ones to tell them how much parking to, re, to include. We'd like to let the market decide that. Um, and then also, um, even in anticipation of, of this, this type of development moving forward, um, the council recently approved, uh, some, on, on site parking or street parking restrictions for the neighborhoods surrounding the downtown uh, where residents are exempted from the, the two hour time limits, for example. So those are, those are ways to respond to, to the overflow parking potential, but it is something that's on our radar and we're, we're aware of that. Thank you. All right. Um, I, th I like this um, preferred alternative in a lot of ways. I, I really like most of the circulation decisions that were that were made. I think that uh, uh, I'm glad to see the um, north-south connections being made on the west side of Highway 101, uh, the Donahue extension, the uh, one in the uh, Catalyst site. I think those are great. I like that all the road diets are you know pretty much going forward. Um, the uh, downtown loop is a cool idea, and I think that if uh, Vice Chair Purser, former Vice Chair Purser, were here, she would be pretty happy about that because when uh, the planning department presented the last uh, time around, I think that she made a point of talking about the historic, um, you know, mass transit when the city was at a smaller scale and bringing back that kind of. Um, mode of transportation and uh, it's a really neat part of the plan and important I think to actually making the area function um, because it's still going to be at kind of a semi walkable scale if you think about the two sides of the the uh, freeway there. So that's a great idea. Um, I think the FAR concept I um, <laughs> it's a uh, going to be an interesting uh, one politically. Um, I like that the levels have been set nice and high, and I think that makes me kind of comfortable uh, with the effect this is going to have on the built environment and how things look, and that I think the transition idea, the transition zone, um, is a good way to keep that um, from impinging too much on the historic districts. Um, but uh, I think there probably is a perception that FAR is a, is a development community preference and uh, that uh, 
there might be some pushback um, on that, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how it's understood, and I think um, people will have quite, quite a few questions. Um, my biggest concern about this is the Roberts neighborhood and the Roberts um, Avenue connection not being part of this plan, and I know that uh, it was you know, maybe determined that a, a vehicular connection wasn't necessary, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, I can, if, if what this represents is this is the best we can do with connecting that to the rest of the plan area, it's just not going to work. Um, this is an improvement. It would be nice to see the Olive Street improvements and the Dutton bus um, frequency and what have you, but um, especially if you know, the Opportunity Zone um, federal incentives work, um, which from what I hear, um, all the signs are that it's a quite powerful force right now in commercial real estate, uh, coupled with the relatively high densities in the Roberts area in the plan and the lack of connection to the rest of the plan area, um, you know, I think that we're gonna probably have quicker development and it's gonna be not oriented toward the downtown. It's, um, I think, going to be an island unto itself and maybe, you know, what this reflects is that it was an overreach to include it in the plan area and that's not for us to talk about. It was a decision that the council made um, earlier in the scoping, but, um, it's not going to work, and if it does work, uh, that people actually do travel in significant numbers between that and the smart station. Um, you know, if anybody who lives in that Roberts area is going to be a car owner in, in all likelihood, and uh, because it really is isolated, uh, and then they're gonna be traveling on Olive Street through the Olive Street neighborhood, and I'm not sure that it's the most suitable um, through fair for what we're envisioning as a uh, you know a, a regional transportation hub to a high density new development. Um, so if it does function, it's got problems, and and if it doesn't function, then um, it it represents I think something that doesn't um, really represent a downtown um, that's cohesive. Um, and then uh, I think, I, I'm not sure whether all these visual depictions are meant to contain every park that, uh, you know, we, we heard that public open space or, or the flexible park requirement and could talk about maybe the political motives behind that. And I'm not saying anybody has them in the city, but um, I can see why those might be an easier sell uh, to the public than parks uh, for a few reasons. but. Uh, if that Roberts neighborhood doesn't have one of those, then um, it, it seems like a pretty bleak uh, sort of new neighborhood that we have in mind. Um, so I would just want it to be that if we are creating new neighborhoods, um, you know, future historic neighborhoods, that they have the, the potential character to actually be historic neighborhoods 50 years from now. Um, the Creek Oriented Development is really nice. Um, I like that Santa Rosa Avenue is being activated and, and going to be turned into the, the visual depictions of that were really a breath of fresh air. And if, if we could um, make that happen, it would be terrific and it would be a good way to integrate the historic uh, neighborhoods that we have down there and, and bring them into the more active downtown. Um, so, Overall, I do really appreciate the, uh, the plan and uh, the pace of the work, and um, I do think it's bold. Um, I just wish I didn't have such a misgiving about what's happened with Roberts. Um, I think even if the underpass were only for non-vehicular traffic, that it would uh, be an important sign that the neighborhood is part of the rest of the plan area, and you know, Roseland, uh, its isolation is a is a you know a defining problem of uh, the city's urban planning, and uh, I don't think without that connection we're going to make much of a dent in it. 
Okay, uh, that is all I have to say. Um, any comments from staff or uh, maybe just the next milestones that's going to planning commission and council? Is that correct? So we'll, uh, we'll be doing a study session tomorrow with the design review board. Um, and then the month of November is really um, meant to, to have this outreach, get the feedback, um, and you know, tweak and modify the plan and try to respond and anticipate as many comments as we can before going before that planning commission, city council um, meeting on December 3rd. So uh, we as staff really appreciate uh, the board taking the time to, to really piece through this. Um, it's an open dialogue, so if, if something comes to mind, if you'd like to put it in writing, uh, feel free to send an email or, or give me a call or, or give uh, anyone else at Planning and Economic Development a call. Um, we'd like to keep this conversation going, especially uh, during this month of November, which is a, a key dynamic time for the development of this plan. So uh, again, thank you very much. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, amazing to have all these details at the uh, forefront of your mind at all times, and it's always impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, website that we've been keeping up. So the website is uh, plandowntownsr.com. So plandowntownsr.com, and anybody can follow the project along its way. Um, which and there's a, a, a way to fill out surveys, submit comments, so it's sort of a one stop to, to keep going. Um, we'll keep feeding that website to in response to um, themes of questions that we get. So we've heard a lot tonight and we'll, we'll make use of that website to answer some of them. Great, thank you very much. We will move on now to item seven, board member reports. Board members, anything to report? Board Member Muser, do you have happiness to report about the outcome of your project? No. All right, uh, seeing none, uh, any department reports besides the one you just gave us? Sorry, the one department report that I was going to report, Patrick touched on earlier, and that is that we had a nice department tour of downtown Petaluma today, and they're transit-oriented or working on transit-oriented development, and um, and it was refreshing. Um, other than that, I think that's about it. Thank you, I just wanted to, I forgot to mention in uh, item 6.1, I thought the staff report was really excellent, and uh, it was great um, uh, level of detail and uh, precision, and uh, always a huge help, so thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned until our next meeting. Thank you. <laughs>